Lord's given me a little message for you tonight. Um, uh, we're going to start out in 1 Timothy 1.19. You had a little verse there. And, uh, and uh, I'll give you a minute to get started, and I'm going to say a little prayer here. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, uh, to uh, share your word tonight. Lord, I know that you gave me this word um, several, several months ago, and I may have spoken it before, Lord, but I, I just ask that you help me with it again, Lord. Help me to um, explain it the way that you want it explained and help people to understand the way that you want them to understand it, Lord. Father God, we thank you for this little meeting tonight that we're having, Lord, and uh, I just ask that you bless us all abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have been made shipwreck. Uh, I want to read it out of the New Living Translation, just because it makes more sense. To, I, get, I can understand it just a little bit better. It says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Well, that would be a spiritual shipwreck now, wouldn't it? Cling to your faith in Christ. You know, that's really all we have think about it and that's all we need is to cling to Christ and cling to everything that Christ stands for keep Christ first in our lives that's the way to uh, to stay on track is to keep Christ first you know even in the Ten Commandments it says to put God number one and to keep our conscience clear how do we keep our conscience clear we deliberately do the right things and stay away from the wrong things. That's the only way that we can keep a clear conscience. Because, because if you do as this says, some people have deliberately violated their consciences. Well, you know what that means? They have continually done wrong over and over and over and over again purposely until it doesn't even seem wrong to them anymore. And that's the way the world has gotten. And you know, it all started out kind of innocent a little bit with, well, everybody else does it. Oh, well, he doesn't get away with it. He does it and God's blessing them. It must be okay. Well, even the deacon in the church is doing it. <laughs> or even the pastor is doing it. The nun... The nun down the road is getting away with it. But that's how it all gets started. People, you know, they, they make an excuse to make it okay. And, you know, it starts out just a little bit and maybe with just a couple of people. And before you know it, you, you know, it used to be, you know, people speeding down the road was very few and far in between. You know, now everybody's speeding down the road. Well, they do it. They did it. I see people doing it all the time. It must be okay. But it's, an, it's, not a, it's not a good place to go to, to say that it's okay. We need to know the Word of God and to hang on to it and follow it because it is the right thing to do. And if we follow it or follow God, then we're not going to fall into that guilty conscience part but speaking of a shipwreck i want to um, read out of acts 27 and this is actually a shipwreck that happened in biblical times and it was when when it was, paul was actually on a ship and he was going to uh, rome to be tried because he was a roman citizen so we're talking about a spiritual shipwreck but i just want to give a physical and actual shipwreck as an example so we can kind of see what I'm talking about as an example what a spiritual shipwreck looks like uh, I'm gonna start in verse 27 it's a lot of reading but you'll understand when I get done it says about midnight on the 14th night of the storm as we were being driven across the Sea of Adria the sailors sensed that land was near 
They dropped a weighted line and found that the waters was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the trailers tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. And just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't even touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape, but the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held onto planks or debris from the broken ship, so everyone escaped safely to shore. See, they had a plan. They, they had several plans throughout this. We could go back and read in front of that, too. And they had several plans, and their plans kept failing because their plans weren't from God. There were plans that they made. But God had other plans. And Paul knew what they were because Paul had been talking to God. And he knew that they were going to be shipwrecked, but he also knew that nobody was going to be hurt. But Paul was the only one that knew and believed that. Because Paul was communicating with God. Now I want to point out too, just for the sake of pointing out, that there was 276 people on this boat. You know, when you think of boats and back in the time of, what was it, maybe 8, 10, maybe 30 A.D., something like that, you know, back about the year zero, you wouldn't think boats would be too big, now would you? Do you know how big a boat has got to be for 276 people to be on it? That's a huge boat. We think that we're pretty doggone smart now. It was a ship, yes. It was a ship. It wasn't a little tiny boat. It was a ship to hold 276 people. That's, that's more people we've had in this church in one time ever. <laughs> ever we, we think we're pretty smart with our technology sometimes but I think that we uh, <laughs> we didn't really have to have radios and cell phones and TVs and, and, and all that stuff to really to actually do great things if God if it's ordained of God for one thing <laughs> But that was just a point that I wanted to make. Maybe they weren't so Stone Age as what we think they were. If they were building ships that would hold 300 people, that's a pretty amazing thing, I think. Um, I don't think we see too many ships nowadays, nowadays that hold 276 people. Maybe some of these Carnival Cruise Lines, what do they hold, maybe 1,000 people or something? Or for that, oh, yeah, that's huge. Well, one thing I wanted to point out about this physical shipwreck is they kept making plans, and their plans had to keep changing because they didn't really know what laid ahead of them. Just like in our lives, we don't know what lays ahead in our lives. We can make all the plans that we want, you know. 
but God is the one who ordains our lives. So, so we can make all the plans that we want, but we're going to be changing them a whole lot too, I'm sure. It's just like Jesus said somewhere in the Bible. He said, you shouldn't be saying that you're going to go off and you're going to buy and sell in this other country because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. <laughs> but also, this was... This was a very chaotic thing. You know, reading it, you might not be able to envision that there was 276 people on board that were all feared for their lives. You know, drowning, to me, drowning would be one of the most horrible deaths that, that you could, anything with suffocation to me is going to be a horrible, horrible death. That would be... A scary thing. And when 276 people are all together, all feared for their lives, and none of them know God but one, what kind of situation do you think that was? People were probably running over the top of each other, trampling each other, yes. They... They were doing, trying to get to the safest place, trying to get to the place that it was going to save their lives, trying to get to the lifeboat, which was cut away, trying to get to anything that they could float on. Can you imagine how chaotic that was? <clears throat> Think how a spiritual shipwreck looks. Sometimes we don't, you know, and, and you don't have a shipwreck on purpose. You don't have a shipwreck on purpose. But there's certain things that you can do to keep from having a shipwreck. A spiritual shipwreck is probably about the same thing because it's very chaotic. Things happen. Things unexpected happen. Things come up that you're not expecting. The, the northeaster is going to come in on you when you're not expecting it. That's why God says to always be ready for anything. Always stand strong in God. So there's things that we should know. Um, study the charts. The captain of the ship is in charge of the charts. That's your maps. That tells you which way, which direction you should be going. Um, Maybe if, uh, maybe if we're going on the sea to heaven, it might be the straight and narrow path. But you know what? You tend to drift this way, and you tend to drift that way. You know, and, and the sailors' maps, they didn't have GPS and all that before. They didn't have satellites up in space, but they charted through the stars. So you had to know where the stars were at that time of the season and where you were in comparison. And I'm not even exactly sure if I can explain how they did it. Because I imagine it's kind of a little bit of a complicated system. But people have been using stars to guide themselves for a long time. Not only on the oceans, but also through the mountains, through the deserts, or or wherever people have traveled. But w what they've done, especially when you go over long expanses of land or long expanses of seas, people made maps of where the stars were in relationship to where you would be. So the captain is always in charge of all these uh, charts. And uh, if the captain doesn't get his charts, out of the cabinet, then they don't do them any good. You, I mean, you could have the best charts in the whole world, which we have right here. We have a very good set of instructions. I mean, if we'll follow them, if we'll read them, you know, and, and it's just like the charts. A quick glance at our charts isn't going to tell us a whole lot captains had to study their charts they had to look very closely because you may not see the the what the coastline looks like 
along the island that you got to go next to. Or you may not see that there's always rough waters going through the channel that you need to go through. You want to be extra careful because you don't want to put yourself or other people or your ship in danger. <laughs> so who's the captain of your ship and where's your charts? Do you keep your charts handy? Have you been studying them? You know, we're on a lifelong journey, you know, and you could say that we're in a boat. So where's your charts? Now, I remember Pastor giving a sermon one time. He's like, are you in the boat or are you out of the boat? <laughs> are you in the boat or out of the boat? <laughs> well, we're in the boat, y'all. We're all in the boat. And we're all headed for heaven, but we're all in separate boats. We mean that we don't have 276 people on our boats. Guess what? We just have ourselves. But sometimes we have people beside us. We may have our wives beside us. We have our kids with us that we're kind of towing along beside us until they can build a little bit bigger boat, you know. But we all have to steer our own boats. And we have to stay on course. So we have to study our charts and we have to keep studying them. And when we think that we completely know our charts, guess what? We better study them some more. Because we're always going to come upon uncharted places. Places that have never been mapped. Even the Bible speaks of every situation that we'll probably ever go through. It may be unfamiliar to us if we're not studying it constantly. Uh, there's uh, there's places to avoid. There's places to visit. There's perils and dangers and reefs and shoals and back currents and shallow water. And, well, we just have to stay on course. Joshua 1.8 should be pretty familiar to you if you've been studying your charts. It says... Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate it on day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything that is written it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. Don't we all want to prosper and succeed? If that's the only way that it says that's how we're going to prosper and succeed. That's the only way. We may not prosper and succeed financially. But the main thing that we're here on in life for is to depend on, to figure out where we're going to spend our eternal life, isn't it? Where do you all want to spend your eternal life? In heaven, exactly. <laughs> so we, we all need to stay on course. Every good sea captain knows how to study weather reports and observe the stars. Um, put up Ephes the Ephesians 6.12, please. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness, in high places. <laughs> I do want to read it out of here just because I like reading out of the New Living Testament. There's nothing wrong with any other. Um, I've just grown accustomed to reading out of the New Living Testament. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You know, if, if everything that, that happened in our lives 
only happened in the natural, we could probably figure it out. But a lot of our battles are really being fought in the heavenlies. And that's why we sometimes have the troubles that we have. <laughs> if, if things are happening spiritually, and if we're not spiritual enough to discern it, where is that going to leave us? That's going to leave our boat <laughs> going to and fro. <laughs> See, we're not, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. And if you think our or our enemy isn't organized <laughs> or intelligent, then you're mistaken. You know, a lot of times we think, ooh, demons, ooh, devils, ooh, imps. Oh, you know, well, they are nothing. But the thing is, they're sly. They're all, you better give them credit for what they do. Because they can sneak in on you. That's right. The, when, whenever you, th okay, look at this next verse. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. See, we need to maintain our ships. We need to keep our ships in tip-top order all the time. You know, you can look at your ship. You can stand out and look at your ship and say, oh, it's a beautiful thing. You know, the stacks are all pretty, you know, and, and, and there's no dents or dings or, or the, you know, uh, the paint looks all good. But until you go underwater and look to see what's the parts in the water and make sure there isn't any holes in the bottom of your hull, because that's what it's called. That below the water line, that's your hole, H-U-L-L, -L, you know, then you really don't know what kind of condition your ship is in. Until you start your motors and test them out, you really don't know what kind of ship you're in. Or if you're in a sailboat, until you raise your sails and put them in the wind and make sure that they're not dry rotted, that you can actually sail and the wind will actually carry you to where you need to go, you don't know what kind of condition your ship is in. Well, so goes our spiritual life. Until we test some things out, we need to maintain our ships. You know, we all need repairs in our lives. Not only our personal lives, but our spiritual lives too. You know, Satan's always, it's just like the weather, is always whipping at the ship. It's always the, uh, the water and the seawater, the salt water is always working on what's underneath. The wind and the heat and the, and the waves and everything is always working on the top part of the ship. You know, it's going to get weathered. It's going to get battered. Things are going to need to be repaired, you know. And so goes our spiritual lives also. You know, you need to keep checking everything constantly. Just when we think that we've got it all under control, something happens. Sister Sandy was just saying something about she couldn't breathe here uh, a few days ago. She started checking everything which it was a good thing to do. Start checking. Start checking yourself. Don't just check physically, but check spiritually also. Speaking of how things work sometimes, I got a bobo on my thumb, you know? Well, it's a very small part of my body. You know, I kind of just barely cut the end of it off, you know? Well, it's very tender, and you just... Do you know how much you use your thumb? <laughs> use your thumb for everything. I'm up here trying to turn pages, and I can't even turn a page in my Bible because my silly thumb. And i got to keep a Band-Aid on it because there's so many nerves right there that, yeah, yes, it hurts. It even hurts with a Band-Aid on it. <laughs> but 
one little part, okay, let me explain it like this. One little part hurts on me, so I can't think, do things properly. So, you know, it'd be like, if I can't turn my page fast enough, or maybe we could uh, say, if I couldn't get out of the road fast enough, if I, you know, it doesn't take much to be wrong with you to possibly something else could go terribly wrong. Do any needed repairs immediately as they come up. Check for any weaknesses in our ship. We may have to bind ropes around the whole of our ship. And that's what they did in here. They, they actually took ropes and lashed around. That was probably a whole lot of rope too for a ship that size. Lashing all the boards together so that they wouldn't bust apart. And sometimes that's what we need to do with our spiritual life too, is lash everything together. Keep everything we got and hold it together. Don't let anything fall apart. And then add to it. Strengthen it even more. Strengthen it any way that you can. <coughs> sometimes we even gotta bail water out of the bilges. The bilges is the inside part of the hole, the hole is, is the out, it would be, well, it's the inside or the outside, but the bilges is the bottom part. And you always end up with water down in the bilges. And uh, even, even ships that, got, that pump them all the time, you know, if you got a constant pump going, you still got water coming in. It doesn't seem to matter. Um, some boats rely on some water coming in to uh, cool different parts of their uh, other boats. Um, or, yes, or you have your ballast tanks, which helps weigh down the boat, keep it shifted one side to the other, keep your front end down, or keep the rear down, uh, depending on what's going on, what kind of waters you're in, how fast or slow you're trying to go. That's right. What, yeah, what kind of cargo you're carrying and, and where it's listing to, how the, which way your boat's listing. That's right. Very good. Brother knows about ships. You, you probably know more than I do about them. But, but um, down inside of your hole, on the inside of your hole, H-U-L-L, is called the bilges. And, and the bilge water that sits down there, if you don't take care of that and maintain it and keep it pumped out and keep that all clean down there, it begins to stink. It, be, <laughs> it begins to uh, have a very foul smell to it. And um, what you have to do is you have to pump it all out and you have to use some kind of detergent to clean it all out and get rid of the smell. Well, I think in our spiritual lives, sometimes we just got to uh, pump a lot of the old out that we're, that's not doing us any good and use God's word and get in there and scrub so that we can smell good again. Okay, we also have to maintain radio contact. You know, Paul didn't have a radio, but he had communication with someone he didn't really need a radio but he still stayed on course because he had communication with God he had someone he could call in an emergency and so do we none of us can last very long without consistent contact with God we need to maintain that radio contact yeah, at first they thought that he was evil and he was going to die, but then they saw because it was a poisonous snake. And then, see, Brother Gerald, that's what I like about you. Not only do you know ships, but you also know the Word of God. <laughs> now, if you ask me which is most important, I'm going to have to tell you. The Word of God. 
You know, we, we got we to gotta keep in touch with God all the time, and, and, and I think the church has kind of been on this a little bit, or at least it's been on my mind anyway. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, uh, never stop praying. Never stop praying. You know what? We can pray all day long. We can pray while we're busy. We're, we can pray while we're up underneath a, a car changing out the oil filter or or uh, whatever that we do under cars. <laughs> I'm glad I don't do under cars anymore. <laughs> um, or we can pray while we're on our lawnmower. Or we can pray while we're weed eating. Or we can pray even while we're in the grocery store. We can pray while we're doing most anything. And we can ask for God's direction in all that we do. Um, I didn't give uh, I didn't give Jason this verse, but this just keeps coming up with me, and and everyone's familiar with this. But Proverbs three five and six: Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. You know what? If God tells you this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to be. That's what Paul did. You know, an angel of the Lord came to Paul and said, look, you're going to be, you're going to go through some stuff. The ship that you're on is going to be shipwrecked. But fear not, because you're not going to be harmed, and neither is any of the 275 other people on here. As long as, you know, you don't freak out and you, you follow God's plan. You know, well, most people would say, shipwreck. I don't want to be shipwrecked, and they'd be, be, be jumping off the ship swimming for shore somewhere, you know? But when we say, well, Lord, shipwreck doesn't sound too good, but if it's in your plan, and it's your will, and that's what we need to do to get to where we're going, to take care of business, to, uh, to do whatever it is that you want me to do, Lord, I'm for it. That's the only time we have should have a, a shipwreck is if God is for us. We should never have a spiritual shipwreck. But if we have to have a physical shipwreck, if it's in God's will, I'm for it. Even though it's got to be a scary thing. But if you ask me, which is scarier, a physical shipwreck or a spiritual shipwreck? I'll have to say that the spiritual shipwreck I never want to go through. I don't want to burn my conscience. I don't want to uh, pretend to know God and not. I don't want to uh, <laughs> spend eternity in a bad place. I want to spend it with, Lord, with the Lord. <sighs> so, what we need to do is we need to continue to study our charts we need to stay in that bible you know it's real easy to take that bible home on sunday and set it on the shelf set it on the table put it in the study wherever and not even look at it for the whole rest of the week but i don't advise it it's real easy to do but i don't advise it Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. God knows what God knows what he's doing. If we let him steer our ship, guess what? Or if we follow God's instructions, guess what? We're going to keep it on. As long as we follow his instructions, then we're on course. Seek his will in all you do. In other words, you know, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Which island do you want me to stop at next, Lord? Who do, you, who do you want me to go pray for next? Who do you want me to, to, uh, to uh, speak your word to next? Uh, you know, what do you want me to do, Lord? Seek his will in all that you do. Lord, do you want me to? You know? And he'll show you what path to take. He'll keep us on course. But anyway, if we study our charts, I'm sorry. If we study our charts and we stay on course, and we maintain our ship. It's very important that we maintain our ship, you know. We need to 
really uh, take a look at our spiritual life, you know, on a regular basis. You know, we, can, we can't just have the idea that, well, hey, I'm saved and I, that's all I've got to do. You know, it's a growing process. We just got to keep working at it continually. And, with, you know, sometimes you can lose progress without even, you know, really realizing it. So that's why we need to maintain our ships. We need to take a look at them. You know, we need to rub out the rusty spots and put some, put some uh, fresh lubricant on, on some spots, you know. Um, sometimes we, uh, we, we just don't know. Uh, you know, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. And then we need to keep in constant radio contact with the Lord. Keep in prayer. Keep on your knees. Keep talking to God. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Keep an open line with, with the Lord, you know. God, God wants interaction with us. You know, he really does. You know what? If you keep in constant contact with the Lord, he loves it so much. And you know what else? We was talking about speaking to the Lord Saturday morning. We was talking about listening to the Lord. You know what? The more you talk to God, the more you can be familiar with his voice. Because sometimes we say, you know, uh, God, is that you? Or is that my imagination? Or is somebody behind me? You know. Uh, <laughs> and we're doubting if it was God. You know, but the more that you talk with him and the more that you sit and listen for the answer, like you always say, Sister Bye, if you pray for 15 minutes, you should sit there for 15 minutes and listen for an answer. Give God his equal time. You know, well, the more times that we hear that answer, the more familiar we are with the Lord's voice. Then there is no doubts. There, there's no doubts that, Lord, I know that was you. I seen a real cute picture the other day. I think it was on Facebook or something. There's two little boys, and they're looking up in the air. You know, they're probably like six or seven or something. They're dressed all, I think they had, one had a raincoat on or some galoshes or something. They're both looking up sky, and it says, um, sometimes I just have to look up and say, I know that was you, Lord. <laughs> real cute little picture. But um, sometimes I do, too. I just look up and I say, I know it was you, God, and I thank you. So I'm not going to keep you all much longer tonight. Um, in fact, um, anybody have any comments, suggestions on how to maintain your ship, how to... Uh